Welcome back to Harambe Talks. This has been such a fun series. You know, we get to talk to people from a wide variety of jobs because the interesting thing about Harambe is so many things revolve around this one image. So uh, today we have a great guest with us today. We have Dax Holt. So Dax, thanks for being here today on the Harambe Talks. Of course, buddy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. You know, it's it's really uh, awesome to be working with you on this project uh, after knowing you for so long. So, you know, we really appreciate you being being part of it because Harambe was such an important part of pop culture, mm-hmm. um, you know. And uh, and so, yeah, I was just uh, wondering, like, what, you know, as Harambe continues, and I, I don't know if you saw that they, they actually, uh, somebody hacked into Google Maps and, and named a bridge that they're building. I think it's in South Carolina or North Carolina, Harambe Memorial Bridge. <laughs> oh, I didn't see that. That's crazy. I'm not surprised, though. I feel like there's so much passion and you know like people feel so strongly about harambe's death even all these years later that it doesn't surprise me that uh people are doing stuff like that memes are still a huge part of pop culture society all of that i think gifs and the motion video have also maybe taken over a little bit but memes are still i think so embedded into our society and uh, there are ways to make jokes. There are ways to, you know, uh, talk to your friends, send your friends what emotion you're feeling right now. Um, you know, and it, it's funny that I think, you know, Harambe became such a global meme so quickly because people could relate or had anger or had sadness associated with one single photo. So, you know, and and as you talk about that, it, it reminds me, you know, for everybody that has is just joining us and and has not seen the movie yet, really quickly, we are going to play the clip uh, where you help us sort of talk a little bit more about that aspect. This story was so polarizing that whether you were on the side of the zoo, whether you're on the side of the mother, there was a meme that could fit your description of the situation and you could put it out there. You could put any title with the picture of Harambe and it would make sense. And it crossed over from politics to parenting to keeping animals caged up. I mean, literally no topic was off limit once a Harambe picture was put into play. This animal was killed in such a a manner that was so controversial that the story remains still as important today as it was in 2016. People haven't forgiven the zookeepers. People haven't forgiven the mother. People haven't forgiven. And so when you have a hot button topic like this and there's a visual representation of that topic, it doesn't go away. Man, how did you book such a beautiful, intelligent person on your your movie like that? (laughs) 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 <laughs> the secrets, the magic of uh, filmmaking. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Uh, by the way, yeah, congratulations yeah. on the movie, the documentary, all of it. Um, yeah, I'm just very excited for your success, buddy. So, so far, the, the reaction is being incredible. Uh, you know, when, when the screening that we had, it was in Cincinnati. It was right next to the zoo where Harambe was killed. And we had a lot of people there that love the zoo. <clears throat> they have yearly passes to the zoo. And afterwards, we had an amazing two-hour-long Q&A. And what we found was um, it's going to be a very challenging topic because people really do love the zoos, and they they love the positive aspects of what yeah. zoos can offer. Um, but to help convince people that maybe we need to think about a new a new approach. I think you're right. I think this is a topic that, you know, you can you can like what zoos do or you can like the experience that zoos give children families and you can not like an action that a a zoo took or you push for change for the next time there is some kind of incident but yeah i can understand why people are getting so fired up you know now i'm i'm really curious to ask you as especially as a father uh and a parent you know it's the thing is, is a lot of people say to me, well, you know, this is a great way to educate the children. As a matter of fact, the Cincinnati Zoo has a motto. Um, I believe it is uh, close enough to care. So the idea is you get there, you see them, they're close to you. You're like, that's a zebra. It's right in front of me. I love this thing. 
I care about it. And, and, and it, it really is an interesting um, uh, argumentation. And I wanted to share with you uh, a new idea where there's actually, they're, they're using a, um, a virtual reality gorilla truck is what it's called. Okay. And so in the Denver Zoo, they have um, added VR that brings you very, very close to the mountain gorillas. Um, if, if the concept is close enough to care, perhaps, you know, if you're in a zoo, you might be 30, 40 feet away from an animal, uh, especially something like a gorilla that it has to have a habitat um, that hopefully nobody gets into. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> But with a virtual version, if you're closer, I wonder if it might lead to more caring, if that if that argument holds. Yeah, I think that there's there's two sides, or well, not two sides, but two visions of that. I think being up close is really like a cool experience for someone, but at the end of the day, it's not real. You know what I'm saying? Like, I think everyone kind of knows it's mm -hmm. not real at the end of the day. It'd be cool to be that close. It'd be cool to go travel and actually see these 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 animals out in the wild like that sounds so cool to me um I, i'm i think you grow a lot of respect though when you see them in real life you know you see how truly big they are how powerful they are how beautiful they are in real life and i think that aspect goes away but i think whatever we can use whatever tools technology we can use to to educate people is, is a plus no matter what yeah, and you know that that's one thing we really talk about in the movie is is how do we find that proper education that will lead to future generations of conservation, you know. Mm -hmm. When I think about, you know, your kids, how do we how do we make sure that the net, their generation is interested in preserving animals that when they hear about a gorilla or hear about a zebra, they think that's important. Uh, you know, I think you know and I think that's a struggle as a parent because you know, you you want your kids to appreciate and value animal life and like growing up and when I was young going to zoos going to I mean SeaWorld SeaWorld is such a controversial topic um, and I think I feel like I have so much respect for animals because of seeing them when I was younger but then having this mental conflict of you know, not supporting necessarily these wild animals caged up in small tanks or little, you know, habitats. And like, how do I give my kids that same respect for animals and to love animals and to care for animals, but not feeling like I want to support a company or, you know, someone like SeaWorld? How, how do you do that? How do you get them to love these animals but seeing them up close in person it gives you so much more respect. I, I think I struggle with that as a, as, a, as a parent. That's a really interesting intersection to, to find to find yourself in, you know. And, and I think that goes to show that all the solutions we have right now just don't work. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the zoos as they are, it, it doesn't work. I need a, a zoo in the wild where we are the ones in the cages. <laughs> <laughs> where we just pop up in little cages out in their in their land their territory and i'm just the little one in the cage looking around at them that's what we need now as a parent i was curious what your reaction was you know in the movie we really go over how everybody went after the mom mm -hmm. uh in order to um you know to i mean there was a lot of anger after it happened and, and it got vented into the mom um, as a parent, how did you feel about that? Or how do you feel about that? So I, I, you know, I look at my situation having been to zoos in the past with my kids and seeing wild animals. I mean, it's tough because I keep a very close eye on my children when we are around cages with big steep walls, you know what I'm saying? But I also know as a parent, kids can be completely unpredictable at some points where you think you're watching them and next second they're, you know, running down the road and you're like, how? I was just watching you. How did it get to this point? How did we get here? And so I, I, I think I see all sides. I see the side of why the hell weren't you watching your child? Why did you not have better protection of your child? How did your child get into a cage in the first place? And the other side of it being it happened so fast. I didn't I didn't know what happened. Um, 
you know, so it, that's a, it's a tough call. I wasn't there. I didn't see it myself. I, you know, I, I wasn't part of it. And so it, it's hard to know or to judge that moment from one parent to another parent. Yeah, it's, you know, we're, we're really hoping that the family watches the movie. Um, you know, we, we, you know, the, the interesting thing is, uh, and actually this is something that we've never actually talked about publicly. So we'll, we'll talk about it for the first time ever. You know, we were able to get some insider information and mm -hmm. speak to some of the people that were involved at the scene. Um, and what we learned is, you know, it's very interesting in the movie, the, uh, the DA says, you know, we did an investigation. We're not going to press charges against the mother. Um, what we learned is there actually no, was no um, investigation by the DA's office. The officer that arrived there interviewed everybody, uh, all the witnesses, all the zookeeping staff. Uh, another officer interviewed the family. Okay. Um, and what they discovered was that the mother was not negligent. So they submitted that, and then the DA just let the emotions cool for a day or two and stepped in and said, we did an investigation, and it's not going to happen. But the interesting thing is it was actually stopped. The investigation, in, in the police's estimation, um, was that day, that exact day. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. you know. And the, and the one other thing that we learned from, from our inside source was that the family kind of was shown as sort of this, like, thuggish couple, you know, but in fact, the woman had a daycare center and the dad, I believe, had like a, an office job. Um, when he went to the hospital, he was in um, like button down shirt. He'd been working. He was he had ran ran right over from the office. So, you know, it is it is interesting. And I, I do think that, you know, none of that negates the, the I, I think that the fact that we have to look at both sides of this, you know, um, but it's just interesting because when we got the inside information that there actually was no investigation by the DA's office, but the DA's office said we have concluded our investigation. Uh, I, what I, they meant was the police concluded it on the scene. Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting that, you know, whether they say something publicly and it's a different story behind the scene, I think that's fascinating. I also think like, I think it's tough, you know, like, kids are unpredictable. At the end of the day, kids are almost like little wild animals themselves. So winding up inside a habitat is not surprising. I think it's it's more of the reaction of the zoo that most people wish could have changed. During all of this research and interviews, um, do you know how that family is doing these days? I mean, what are we, seven years after the incident? You know, I got to imagine that was a pretty big mental toll on them as a family, as a, on this kid. Um, I'm sure they got tons of death threats and people coming after them because it was such a hotbed topic. Do you know how they're doing these days? You know, they are, I was able to locate them, um, mm -hmm. but they didn't respond to me at all. And I just like, I really hope they see this movie, you know, because mm -hmm. it, it will, speak to them as being people instead of just sort of these evil villains in the story. Um, they, you know, they left social media. Uh, they're, they went into hiding basically. Um, and I, now the other interesting thing is we don't know it for a fact, but we're pretty sure that there was some kind of a settlement between the zoo and the family because the family never spoke out again. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. And they just disappeared. Um, you know, so yeah, I, you know, and, and like I said, she had a daycare and that was closed with all the backlash. Um, so the family, they, they still, to this day, I, I don't think Isaiah has uh, any social media. I think that they, you know, are still sort of protecting him, um, you know, from it. And they're very, very difficult to, um, to get a hold of. They, yeah, it's they, crazy they to think, about. crazy to think how one, day out at the zoo that you think is going to be a fun family outing turns into the biggest nightmare of your life. Right. Yeah. I mean, Matt, yeah, that like that kid has a story that literally nobody else in the world has. Yeah. Like we were talking about is, is that intersection of where Harambe became an interesting connection, you know, between animal rights and pop culture. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you know, now pop culture generally is something that is something that is very positive. It makes you feel good. You know, it's fun. It has great high energy. It's fantastic, you know, uh, type, type of emotion to it. So animal rights, obviously, is a, <laughs> it's never, you know, quite, quite the same thing that tends to make people reevaluate or sometimes go bad in there. Um, it, to your mind, can you think of any other symbols uh, like Harambe that, that we have? So I would challenge you on the pop culture thing only because when I think of pop culture, I think of anything that is big that everyone is talking about in that moment, whether that does make you feel good or not feel good. It is a relevant topic in society that everyone knows and wants to chat about. So that's when I think of pop culture. It could encompass kind of anything. And I think Harambe became a pop culture topic because the world was talking about it. Just like, I mean, you could go as far as saying we're all talking about the war in the Middle East. And it has become a topic where people are doing memes. They're showing cartoons. They're showing things to get their point across on whatever side of the line that they fall on because they're trying to express their feelings. And, you know, it, I, I really feel that it could encompass anything. And so, but I, I, you know, it's, it's not every day that a topic like Harambe becomes a worldwide topic. You don't, you know, these um, animal rights activists, you know, you, you saw it also with Tiger King, you know, when that came out and how people were so polarizing on each side and, whether you you love big cats but you don't want them to be caged or you know you i mean thought carol baskin killed her husband i mean all of these things that you everyone knows what it is so that's why the meme goes so far because if you can recognize the image that is captured there you have some feelings some sort of way when you see it and that's why i think harambe became such a big viral meme so quickly Wow. Yeah. You know what? Talking about pop culture, you just blew my mind, rearranged it and changed it. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> I, I absolutely, that's, that's perfect. All right. Well, Dax, thanks so much for taking the time to be here with us today. Really appreciate it. And thank you for being part of the movie and supporting the movie, the story and the topic. Love everybody. Thank you so much for having me on. All right. Thanks again. Talk to you Bye. soon. Bye, man. Thanks for joining Dax. I really appreciate you being here today. Um, amazing conversation and a really fascinating topic to think about it from a parental perspective, whether you are the parent of the child that fell in the exhibit or a parent that heard about it or a parent that was there or a parent that today has to make that difficult choice like Dax talked about. How do we make sure that we're creating compassion properly uh, without contributing to the exploitation of animals. And I think as we were talking about it, you know, it, it really shows that we we just don't have that answer yet. We're working towards it, but we don't have it yet. So these are the conversations that we need to have surrounding movies like Harambe, like The Conservation Game, like Tiger King. These are the topics that we need to have so that we can make sure that we're doing right by all of our relatives on this planet. Um, so, you know, I, I really believe that what he was talking about today was, was so critical in so many different aspects. So this is something I would love to hear everyone's opinion. Uh, what do you think? How do you think we can go about it? What do you think about the virtual reality at the Denver Zoo? And what do you think about the actual captivity, the educational aspects of it? And how do you teach your kids? So this is very interesting. So, you know, if, if they have this, do we need to have zoos? Can, can a VR type of thing replace it? Or how can we, this is, a, I think, the biggest trick is how do we teach compassion in a way that doesn't teach selective compassion?